I'll actually pray. God, thank you for tonight. Thank you that your word is powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. God, it's the reason we come here is so that we can study your word to see what you have to say to us. So tonight I ask that you would open up our eyes so that we can see you. God, that we could grow in a relationship with you. And I pray that you would restore to us the joy of our salvation. For us who are weary, who are heavy laden, knocked down because of the, the, the hustle and bustle of the, of the day. God, because of things at work, things in our family. God, all these things can be taken away from us. God, our, our joy, if it's found in anything but you, can be easily taken away. God, but I thank you that our joy is rooted in you. Our hope is in you. This life doesn't always turn out how we want it to, but God, we know you're working, and that's what we're going to learn about tonight. So I pray that you would open up our hearts to your word and your word to our hearts as we come willing and obedient to hear from you. God, we love you, and we give this time to you. Be blessed. In Jesus' name, amen. Psalm 92. Let's read it. It is, a good, it is good to give thanks to the Lord and to sing praises to your name, O Most High, to declare your loving kindness in the morning and your faithfulness every night on an instrument of ten strings, on the lute and on the harp with harmonious sounds. For you, Lord, have made me glad through your works. <laughs> I will triumph in the works of your hands. O oh Lord, how great are your works. Your thoughts are very deep. A senseless man does not know, nor does a fool understand this. When the wicked spring up like grass and when all the workers of iniquity flourish, it is that they may be destroyed forever. But you, O oh Lord, are on high forevermore. For behold, your enemies, O oh Lord, for behold, your enemies shall perish. All the workers of iniquity shall be scattered. But my horn, strength, you have exalted like a wild ox. I have been anointed with fresh oil. My eyes also have seen my desire on my enemies. My ears hear my desire on the wicked who rise up against me. Verse 12 of 92. The righteous shall flourish like a palm tree. He shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Those who are planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of God. They shall still bear fruit in old age. They shall be fresh and flourishing. Last verse, verse 15. To declare that the Lord is upright. He is my rock. And there is no unrighteousness in him. The teaching tonight for you note takers, is he is my rock and there is no unrighteousness in him. He is my rock and there is no unrighteousness in him. As we're going through this psalm, this is what the psalmist comes to at the end of this beautiful psalm, is this statement that the Lord is my rock and there is no unrighteousness in him. So let's look at the psalm. Psalm chapter 92. We'll read verse 1 and go from there. This is it. It is good to give thanks to the Lord and to sing praises to your name, O Most High. First thing I want to note in this, and for you guys, um, this is something I didn't know that I, it's, it's really brought a lot of depth to my Bible study and things like that. Um, it's one of the words in here is Lord, and you see it capitalized. It's a really cool thing because uh, you, you'll see oftentimes like Lord, lowercase, and then Lord capitalized all throughout it. And what that means for us uh, is that it, it's using the, the Lord's name in Hebrew, I guess. It's not like God, because that's Elohim in Hebrew, and it's not Lord, like Master, because that's Adonai, but they use another one for Lord, and that's uh, like Jehovah or Yahweh. It's that Y-H-V-H, Yahweh, and, and a lot of people, they, they don't know how to pronounce it. Uh, nobody knows how to pronounce it nowadays. A lot of people will tell you, hey, it's pronounced Jehovah. Some people will say, no, it's pronounced Yahweh. I have a friend in Hawaii named Kali'i. He 
he's an awesome guy. He's like, dude, no one knows what it is, man, but I, I like to say it's Yahiwihi. You know? You know, praise Yahiwihi. So if I say Yahiwihi tonight in place of Lord, that's the reason why. Please don't call me a heretic or anything like that. We're not sure about the vows. I mean, I'm sure that it's probably not Yahiwihi, but I kind of like Yahiwihi, so um, forgive me whenever I use that, okay? So it is good to give thanks to Yahiwihi to Jehovah, to Yahweh, God. It is good to give thanks to God. Colossians 3, verse 17, 23 says this, and whatever you do in word and deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God, the Father through him. Verse 23, and whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men. In this verse, this first verse, we see that God is transcendent, which means God is above everything, but at the same time, God is not so far above that he hasn't uh, decided to have relationship with us. God is transcendent, yes, he's above all, but he is also eminent. He is close to us. He wants to hang out with us. God wants a relationship with us. This God who is above our thinking. Have you guys ever contemplated God, thought about him? Man, when you start thinking about eternity and, and him being no beginning, no end, it starts to hurt your head. And you're like, how can this God have a relationship with me? This scripture says God, it's good to give God thanks and praise. He is the most high. This is a great privilege. He's relatable. Verse 2, declare your loving kindness in the morning. To declare your loving kindness in the morning and your faithfulness every night. I wanted to give you guys uh, a couple verses that relate to God's loving kindness and his faithfulness. And the first one is this. Lamentations 3.23. Through the Lord's mercies we are not consumed because his compassions fell not. They are not or they are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Sometimes when Pastor David talks about this verse... You know, he, he'll say, you know, hey, you know, his mercies are new every morning. And you know why? It's because we used yesterday's up, and we need a fresh batch today. This verse is telling us this, to declare your loving kindness in the morning and your faithfulness every night, the loving kindness of the Lord, Romans 2, 4. Or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? Romans 5, 8, this is the loving kindness of our God. But God demonstrates his own love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Now let's go on to the faithfulness. Philippians 1, 6, we are confident of this very thing, that he who has began a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. God is faithful First John 1 John 1.9, the last verse on his faithfulness. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, all wickedness. If we come to God, he is faithful, and it's because of his love. God's loving kindness is fresh every morning. When you wake up, guys, I hope you see this. And when you go to bed at night after this world has beaten you down, And you're like, man, that was a long day. I hope that you see that God's love is continuing to be with you. God's faithfulness lasts. And then the next day, guess what? His mercies are new every morning. And this is something to rejoice in. This is something to sing about. And this is what the psalmist is doing here. He's saying, it is good to sing this. And this is our first life lesson. And this is what I I want you guys to to pull from this, is this, that we are to preach the gospel to ourselves as well as others. Preach the gospel to yourself and to others in song. The psalmist is singing this. Does the psalmist know that God is love and that he's faithful? Yeah, he's experienced it. Why does he need to sing about it? Well, it's good to remind yourself. And it's good to remind yourself of what Jesus Christ has done to show us that in the cross, that he's faithful, that he's love, that he gave his life for us. This is a good thing to sing about, and that's the reason we sing here at church. This is why we sing in this place, is because God is faithful, and God is love, 
And that is so good. No matter what's going on, that is steadfast. God's love and faithfulness. The gospel and song. We've heard them all. Um, One of my favorites is How Deep the Father's Love. How deep the Father's love for us. How vast beyond all measure that he would give his only son to make a wretch his treasure. Mm. That's good. In Christ alone, my hope is built, is found. All other ground is sinking sand, right? How about this one? Hey, I just met you, and this is crazy, but here's the gospel. Come on, not number. (laughs) Really? We're going to do that? Unbelievable. Here's the gospel, so call him later. Right? That's a new one. That's fresh. I thought you guys would like that. All right. Verse, verse 3, let's go on. On an instrument of ten strings, on the lute and the harp with harmonious sound. Again, this place is a place where we can come. Man, we get awesome worship. Would you guys agree with that? Man, we get, This is a place that loves to sing and shout and dance. And for good reason, music pleases God. And we should use it. The worship team, Merritt, Rob, we have Jeff. Pastor David, coming out and leading us in song, that is beautiful to God. And that's such a privilege. And tonight we're going to end with a worship song. And I pray that you guys would worship the Lord, that you would give him praise. You'd encourage others to do the same. God created music, and when we do it, we are glorifying him. I love new songs. I don't know if you guys can tell that or not. I love new songs because I think that we're mimicking God's creative power, and I think it blesses God whenever we create, because that's what God made us to do, is to create new things. All this technology, yeah, it can be used for bad, but inherently, it's not a bad thing. That we are using our minds to create, and we're mimicking God's creative ability, God is pleased with that. That's an amazing thing. Guys, you don't have to be um, somebody amazing. You have to be like a Michael W. Smith. You don't have to be uh, a Lecrae. I don't know if you guys know who that is. You don't have to be these particular people in order to to glorify God in this way. Sing a song from your heart. One of the worst singers I've ever heard in my life. He's walking around church all day and he's singing songs like, Oh, Jesus. And he's just making it up. And I'm like, okay, dude. The one reason he, he does that is because he can't remember a lyric to a song. But... The other reason is because he's just singing for joy in the Lord. And I praise the Lord for D.A. He's amazing. It's cool. I mean, it's awesome, right? Uh, it's, it's so good, man. And when I hear it, I'm like, I'm like, yeah, Jesus. We're in the bathroom like, yeah. Stranger walks by. We're like, oh, that's weird. Yeah. What? Like, what are, what are you doing in the bathroom, man? That's weird. All right. So with that, Isaiah 42, verse 10. Here it goes. Sing to the Lord a new song. This is God's command to us, encouragement to us. Sing to the Lord a new song and his praise from the ends of the earth. Everywhere you go, shout it out from the rooftop. Sing to the Lord. Sing of his faithfulness, his loving kindness. You who go down to the sea and all that is in it, you coastlands and you inhabitants of them. Psalm 96, 1 through 6. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name, proclaim the good news. Gospel, preach the gospel to yourself and others. Proclaim the good news, the scriptures say, of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his wonders among all peoples. For the Lord is great and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the people are idols. But the Lord made the heavens. There is no one like Jehovah. There's no God like Jehovah. Right? That's a 90s song for some of you guys. For all the gods of the people are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Honor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. This is our God. And here's the next life lesson. 
Music should be a result of worship. Get, get this, you ready? Music should be a result of worship, not the only worship that you do. Worship should be the result of, or music should be the result of worship, not the only worship that you do. Sometimes I'm a little weary. Sometimes I'll, I watch myself, because sometimes I'll call what we do music-wise worship. But worship goes much deeper than that. Like, okay, guys, uh, we got 30 minutes of worship, and then after that's teaching. But, guys, what I want you to see tonight is that music is not just, it's just one aspect of worship. And worship, music should, worship, like worship and music, it, it should flow from a heart of us already worshiping God. What we're doing right now is a song to God. Because we are looking into his word, we are saying, God, speak to me. And God is doing that. And this is worship. So when we sing, it should flow from a heart of worship, a heart that's already worshiping God. And that will continue to worship after we sing. This is what the beauty of music is. Worship to the Lord. Verse 4 of this uh, Psalm 92. For you, Yahweh, you, Yahiwihi, have made me glad through your work. Lord, I will triumph in the works of your hands. The scriptures say, you've made me glad. I don't know who wrote this psalm, if it was David or if it was someone else, but if it, if it, if it was David, then you guys all know David's story. He wasn't free of disappointment. He wasn't free of um, all the bad things that happened with life. You know, he saw a lot of bad things, and a lot of bad things happened to him. He was chased by a king, even though he didn't deserve it. David wasn't free from disappointment. But David, in this, we see that he says, God, you have made me glad through your work, and I will triumph in your works. No matter what's going on, I'm going to worship you, God. I have decided in my heart that I'm going to worship you because of this. Let's go back. Your faithfulness, loving kindness. Nehemiah 8, 9 through 10. Let's go to that. I love the word of God. We're going to keep on looking into these scriptures. I hope that God speaks to you. And Nehemiah, who was the governor, Ezra the priest and the scribe, and the Levites who taught the people, said to all the people, this day is holy to the Lord, your God. Do not mourn and do not weep. For all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. So the people heard the words of the law, and they were sad for probably various reasons. Maybe because they saw their disobedience. Maybe they felt guilty. But he corrects them quickly, and he says this. Then he said to them, go your way. Eat the fat. Stop mourning. Drink the sweet. And send portions to those for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy to our Lord. Do not sorrow for the joy of of the Lord is your strength. The joy of the Lord is your strength. This unending knowledge that God's faithfulness is there every night, his loving kindness every morning. God's joy is our strength. This is where we find joy because this doesn't change. This world changes. Everything over here is crazy. We get pulled away, but we come back to our anchor, to our rock. And that's why the title is, he is my rock. There is no unrighteousness in him all that's going on. Romans 8, 28. This is for us. A lot of you guys have memorized this one. It's good. And we know that all things work together for the good of those who love God to those who are called according to his purpose. All things work together for the good. How do we know this? Well, I can guarantee you this. The God who speaks this is a God who experienced this same thing. Jesus Christ came down to earth he made his home among us. And he experienced suffering and death and pain on the cross, and he chose it. No matter what you're going through, this is something that God wants you to grab hold of tonight. That whatever's going on, all things work together for the good of those who love the Lord. God is working out a marvelous plan. Even in the midst of a cross, we saw that Jesus submitted to the Father and God came through. 
God did an awesome thing. God redeemed humanity because of what Jesus did. Even in the worst of trials, whatever you're going through, remember this. The scriptures tell us, fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy, this joy, this faithfulness of God, the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and now he's seated at the right hand of God. This is our God, and this is what we can rejoice in. We know that if we run this race with endurance, looking to Jesus Christ, all things work together for the good of those who love God. In, uh, in 180, we're going through Philippians, and one thing I keep on telling them is, be careful what you call bad, because God is using those things. God is working through those things. The works of your hands, the works of God's hands calls David to rejoice. David rejoiced in God's amazing plan. He knew that no matter what was going on, God was working. Verse 5. O oh Lord, O oh Yahweh, Jehovah, how great are your works. Your thoughts are very deep. A senseless man doesn't know, nor does a fool understand this. When the wicked spring up like grass, when all the workers of iniquity flourish, it is that they may be destroyed forever. Okay, I just thought about the grass. Pesky. Okay, if you go outside right here on the, on the gravel, you'll see grass is growing up through the gravel. And I'm like, every time I pass by it, I'm like, oh, why is that grass? Okay, and this is what David's feeling right now as he's looking at the wicked and they're, and they're prospering and they're flourishing and, and it appears like God's not doing anything. God's like, oh, whatever they want to do, you know. And David's like, they, look at them. They're going, it, it's driving me a little crazy right now. It is that they may be destroyed forever, he said. But you, Lord, you reign on high. You who are the most high, you are high forevermore. For behold your enemies, O Lord, for behold your enemies shall perish. All the workers of iniquity shall be scattered. God has done so much. And David rejoiced in his works. Three things, three works that we can rejoice in that I'm going to go quickly through. Creation, Psalm 19, verse 1. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament show his handiwork. Day unto day utters forth speech. And night and tonight reveals knowledge. As we look at creation, as we look at the sky, we look at the, the heavens, the earth, as we look at ourselves, the things that God created, we rejoice because we see God is amazing, that God is so wise. As we look through a telescope, we see the amazing fine-tuning of this universe. When we look into our atoms, we see the complexity that we're made up of, and we rejoice in God. This causes us to rejoice. Number two, something that we can rejoice in, the working of world orders. That God's working in, in, in the government of every place on earth. Even though we might look and say, oh, they're growing like grass, and they just keep on flourishing. They don't stop. I can't, I can't stand it. God's working. This is something that Habakkuk had to go through. Habakkuk uh, chapter 1, verse 5. This is God replying to him. After he's like, God, what are you going to do? Are you going to let the righteous flourish? And God's like, look among the nations and watch. Be utterly astounded, for I will work a work in your day which you would not believe me if it were told to you. God said, man, get on my level. If you could see, you wouldn't even believe it. I'm God. I'm amazing. And Habakkuk had a heart check, and he's like, yeah, yeah, that's true. And later, in hindsight, because we get the privilege of that right now, we see that the Babylonians, which came in, they're no longer there. That others rise up, and God judged that nation. We see that God's, the Nebuchadnezzar's no longer on the throne. But guess who's on the throne in heaven right now? Guess who's in control of everything? We can rejoice in this, guys, that God is in control of the world orders. Number three, salvation. We can rejoice that God has saved us. As I mentioned earlier, the cross. We see God 
judging sin on the cross. And we rejoice in that because it's not by our works that we're saved. It's by faith. It's by trusting in him who did the work. We all know it. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. If you've done that, rejoice in the Lord. Tonight, rejoice in the Lord. Look over to someone else. Say, rejoice in the Lord. Romans eleven thirty three. 33, oh, the depths of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. God, you are so big. I can't imagine how you figured this all out. Here's another one, 1 Corinthians 1, 23. But we preach Christ crucified. The cross, we preach the cross. To the Jews, a stumbling block, and to the Greeks, foolishness. To the Jews, a stumbling block, because they're like, okay, it's by the law that I get, I get into heaven. And so when Jesus came, all of a sudden it was like faith. But it was always faith. They just had their, you know, they, they were just confused. So it was a stumbling block. When Jesus came, it was a stumbling block for them. They thought he was going to come reigning, a reigning king. But he came first as a suffering servant. To the Greeks, it was foolishness. They're like, oh, yeah, right, a, a guy came and died. You know, that's foolish. We're going to keep on trusting in our pagan gods. But we can rejoice because to, to the world, our Savior dying on a cross, that looks dumb. That looks ridiculous. But that's what God did because he is wise, and we know it now. Defeated death by dying and rising again, that's insane. As you look at creation, history, and world events, the cross, we realize this, that God's just. That no sin goes unpunished. We know the verse. The wages of sin is death. Everything that is wrong in this world is going to be made right, and God's going to judge every person who, who's done wicked, even to the point where he would judge me and you. But it also says this, but God's gift is eternal life through Christ Jesus. And that's something we can rejoice in. Because God will overlook my sin. Well, let me take that back. God doesn't overlook my sin. He dealt with it on the cross. Because he's, he's God. And he does what's right. And that's what we're going to rejoice in tonight. Is that he's just. Here's the next life lesson. You can always count on God. You can always count on God to be just, to be right, to be loved, to have good motives. You can always count on God. Guaranteed. Here's a song. Some of you guys might not know it. He may not come when you want him, but he'll be there right on time. He's an on-time God. Yes, he is. He's an on-time God. Yes, he is. Well, he may not come when you want him, Anybody know it? But it'll be there right on time. I used to hear that in Pentecostal church. We used to get down on the piano and organ. It was awesome. <clears throat> this is a sobering fact for us, and we see it on the cross demonstrated. Let's go to verse 10. I'm not trying to take up all your night, sorry. By, uh, but my horn, my strength, you have exalted like the wild ox. I have been anointed with fresh oil. Let's go to the, verse 11. My eye also has seen my desire for my enemies. My ears hear my desire for the wicked who rise up against me. Five things to remind yourself when your world starts crumbling, when you see things not going your way. Here's quick five things. Here you go. Number one, you have eternal life. Number two, this world is not your home. This world is passing away. Number three, you get God. You have a relationship with him. If everything else crumbles, this life can be taken away from you. Your sight can be taken away from you. Your money can be taken away from you. Your car, your vehicle, uh, your, your house. All these things can be taken away from you. 
Whenever your world starts crumbling, realize this. There's one thing that cannot be taken away from you, and that's your relationship with God, because God has not given that up to chance. God has secured that. So you get God. Number four, remember this, that God works out all things for the good of those who love him. 828, there it is again. And number five, remember that God sympathizes with us through Jesus. We can rejoice in this, that his trial and pain paved a way for us to go to heaven. That whatever you're going through, realize this, that God has been through the same thing. Everything that you endure in this world, God went through. He didn't have to. God did not have to do this, but he chose to. Jesus Christ came down to earth and suffered. He experienced pain and death. You're telling me that the God of the universe came down and did this? That is insane. But that shows the wisdom of God. And that shows us God's love. Because I'm thinking God is above that. But he's like, you know what? I'm, I'm not above that. But I'm going to come down and I'm going to sympathize and I'm going to walk with you. And I'm going to show you that through his power and his strength, you can do it. So when your world starts to crumble, realize this, that God sympathizes with you. That God experiences the same thing. That God loves you. He won't leave you. Let's go to verse 12. The righteous shall flourish like a palm tree. He shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Those who are planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of God. They shall still bear fruit in old age. They shall be fresh and flourishing. The words there, just like that grass out there that bugs me, just like the the wicked that bugged David, flourishing growth, planted, bear fruit, fresh. Those are the words that we just read. And those are something that God guarantees for those of us who are in Christ Jesus. These are all words that mean success in the life of a plant. And it's important that you guys realize this, that God measures success differently than we do. If you look at the world, see the way it's going, you see that Even us, we fall prey to this, that we measure success in the amount of money that we have. For some of us high schoolers or middle schoolers, how good looking our girlfriend is, or how good looking our boyfriend is, how many friends we have. We think success is built on all sorts of things. How big our house is, how much fame we can get, but we're wrong. God measures success in a different way. Proverbs 22, 1. A good name is to be chosen rather than great riches. Don't put your trust in riches. Loving favor rather than silver and gold. Listen to me. Loving favor. Rewind to the beginning of this teaching. It's God's loving kindness. We have God's loving favor on our lives. We rejoice in that. That's to be chosen more than riches. You want a successful life? Give your life to Jesus. Surrender to him. All to Jesus I surrender all to him I freely give. Surrender. Joshua 1.8. This book of law, this scripture that you hold in your hand tonight, shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night. Oh my gosh, day and night again. Loving kindness, faithfulness, day and night, meditating on the word of God, meditating on the gospel, the good news, finding joy, letting that be our strength. Listen, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then, listen, only then, when you get this heart, of thankfulness to God, and you're in his word, when you're seeking him in a relationship with him, only then will you make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. That's a promise from God's word, and that's what we're doing tonight. We are honoring God by looking in his word. We are trusting him. What a privilege. God may choose to bless you with things, Because money is not inherently wrong. 
Fame isn't inherently wrong. God may choose to bless you with these things, but never make those things the main thing. That's what we see so oftentimes. Never make those things the main thing. An end in themselves. Psalm chapter 1, verse 1 and 3, and I promise we're ending right now. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight, you want a blessed life? Listen to this. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree. Listen. This is a promise. Planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, but whatever he does shall prosper. Mm. Again, that is good news for us. A relationship with God, and we flourish, we grow in the Lord. God gives us success in our life. Again, not success measured by the world standards but he gives us joy that is our strength. At the end of the day, as you live this life, you might not have everything this world deems as successful, but I promise you this, you will have made an impact in, in, in this life. You will have made an impact for people whenever you submit to the Lord and when you decide in your heart that you're gonna rejoice in the midst of trials and tribulations, when you fix your eyes on Jesus, I promise you'll make an impact. And that's what this is about. This is what this church is about. That is what 180 is about. That's what this week was about. And that's what I want you guys' life to be about, whether or not you're here or somewhere else, making an impact in people's lives. Not only that, but having joy in your own heart and you living a successful life. This is what God wants. Number five, or verse 15, and the, I believe, last verse. Here it is. To declare, listen, to declare that the Lord is upright, that he is righteous, that he does what is right. There is no wrong in him, that he is my rock, and there is no unrighteousness in him. The last life lesson is this. Spend time with Jesus, and your life will make an impact. Spend time with Jesus, and your life will make an impact. Tonight, we read the scripture, and now I want to invite you guys to spend time with Jesus. First off, if you've never given your life to the Lord, I want to lead you in a short prayer. Maybe God's tugging on your heart, and, and you're thinking, man, God is righteous, He's always in control. He always has been in control. He always will be in control. I need to give him my life. And I, my life needs to be a song to other people. I need to preach the gospel to others. This is good news that Jesus Christ came and he died for a sinner like me. This is good news. Maybe that's you. And for the first time, God's opening your eyes to this fact. Right now, I want to lead you in a prayer. If maybe you've forgotten this, and maybe you're mad at God, shaking your fist at God, saying, God, why are you allowing this to happen in my life? Maybe God's shown you tonight that God is still working. I imagine Jesus could have looked at the Father and said, Father, why are you allowing this to happen in my life? But he didn't. He submitted to the will of the Father. And because of it, the Bible says he's seated at the right hand of God. Now we can live lives the same way that our dying Savior did. So I invite you tonight to give your life to the Lord, to surrender yourself afresh. And just like this uh, verse speaks of in the middle, which I didn't talk about much, but he will renew your strength. He will give you strength. Let's bow our heads and pray. God, thank you so much for tonight. Thank you for an opportunity to love you and know you and to look into your word and have your word speak to us. 